This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Chapter 13 The Pirate Crew Set Sail. Tom's mind was made up now. He was gloomy and desperate. He was a forsaken, friendless boy, he said. Nobody loved him. When they found out what they had driven him to, perhaps they would be sorry. He had tried to do right and get along, but they would not let him. Since nothing would do them but to get rid of him, let it be so. And let them blame him for the consequences. Why shouldn't they? What right had the friendless to complain? Yes, they had forced him to it at last. He would lead a life of crime. There was no choice. By this time he was far down Meadow Lane, and the bell for school to take up tingled faintly upon his ear. He sobbed now, to think he should never, never hear that old familiar sound any more. It was very hard, but it was forced on him. Since he was driven out into the cold world, he must submit. But he forgave them. Then the sobs came thick and fast. Just at this point he met his soul's sworn comrade, Joe Harper, hard-eyed and with evidently a great and dismal purpose in his heart. Plainly here were two souls with but a single thought. Tom, wiping his eyes with his sleeve, began to blubber out something about a resolution to escape from hard usage and lack of sympathy at home by roaming abroad into the great world never to return, and ended by hoping that Joe would not forget him. But it transpired that this was a request which Joe had just been going to make of Tom, and had come to hunt him up for that purpose. His mother had whipped him for drinking some cream which he had never tasted and knew nothing about. It was plain that she was tired of him and wished him to go. If she felt that way, there was nothing for him to do but succumb. He hoped she would be happy and never regret having driven her poor boy out into the unfeeling world to suffer and die. As the two boys walked sorrowing along, they made a new compact to stand by each other and be brothers, and never separate till death relieved them of their troubles. Then they began to lay their plans. Joe was for being a hermit, and living on crusts in a remote cave, and dying, some time, of cold and want and grief. But after listening to Tom he conceded that there were some conspicuous advantages about a life of crime, and so he consented to be a pirate. Three miles below St. Petersburg, at a point where the Mississippi River was a trifle over a mile wide, there was a long, narrow, wooded island, with a shallow bar at the head of it, and this offered well as a rendezvous. It was not inhabited. It lay far over towards the further shore, abreast a dense and almost wholly unpeopled forest. So Jackson's Island was chosen. Who were to be the subjects of their piracies was a matter that did not occur to them. Then they hunted up Huckleberry Finn, and he joined them promptly, for all careers were one to him. He was indifferent. They presently separated to meet at a lonely spot on the river-bank, two miles above the village, at the favorite hour, which was midnight. There was a small log raft there which they meant to capture. Each would bring hooks and lines, and such provision as he could steal in the most dark and mysterious way, as became outlaws and before the afternoon was done they had all managed to enjoy the sweet glory of spreading the fact that pretty soon the town would hear something. All who got this vague hint were cautioned to be mum and wait. About midnight Tom arrived with a boiled ham and a few trifles, and stopped in a dense undergrowth on a small bluff overlooking the meeting-place. It was starlight and very still. The mighty river lay like an ocean at rest. Tom listened a moment but no sound disturbed the quiet. Then he gave a low, distinct whistle. It was answered from under the bluff. Tom whistled twice more. These signals were answered in the same way. Then a guarded voice said, "'Who goes there?' "'Tom Sawyer, the Black Avenger of the Spanish Main. Name your names.' "'Huck Finn, the Red-Handed, and Joe Harper, the Terror of the Seas.' Tom had furnished these titles from his favorite literature. "'Tis well.' Give the countersign. Two hoarse whispers delivered the same awful word simultaneously to the brooding night. Blood! Then Tom tumbled his ham over the bluff and let himself down after it, tearing both skin and clothes to some extent in the effort. There was an easy, comfortable path along the shore under the bluff, 
but it lacked the advantages of difficulty and danger so valued by a pirate. The terror of the seas had brought a side of bacon, and had about worn himself out with getting it there. Finn, the red-handed, had stolen a skillet and a quantity of half-cured leaf tobacco, and had also brought a few corn-cobs to make pipes with. But none of the pirates smoked or chewed but himself. The black avenger of the Spanish main said it would never do to start without some fire. That was a wise thought. Matches were hardly known there in that day. They saw a fire smouldering upon a great raft a hundred yards above, and they went stealthily thither and helped themselves to a chunk. They made an imposing adventure of it, saying, Hist! every now and then, and suddenly halting with finger on lip, moving with hands on imaginary dagger-hilts, and giving orders in dismal whispers that, if the foe stirred, to let him have it to the hilt, because dead men tell no tales. They knew well enough that the raft's men were all down at the village laying in stores or having a spree, but still that was no excuse for their conducting this thing in an unpiratical way. They shoved off presently, Tom in command, Huck at the after-oar, and Joe at the forward. Tom stood amidships, gloomy-browed, and with folded arms, and gave his orders in a low, stern whisper. "'Luff, and bring her to the wind!' "'Aye, aye, sir!' "'Steady, steady!' "'Steady it is, sir. Let her go off a point. Point it is, sir.' As the boys steadily and monotonously drove the raft toward midstream, it was no doubt understood that these orders were given only for style, and were not intended to mean anything in particular. "'What sail she carrying?' "'Courses, top-sails, and flying jibs, sir. Send the riles up. Lay out aloft there, half a dozen of ye, for top manstuzzle. Lively now. Aye, aye, sir. Shake out that main to gallanzel. Sheets and braces. Now, my hearties. Aye, aye, sir. Heel em a lee, hard a port. Stand by to meet her when she comes. Port, port, now, men, with a will. Steady, steady it is, sir.' The raft drew beyond the middle of the river. The boys pointed her head right, and then lay on their oars. The river was not high, so there was not more than a two- or three-mile current. Hardly a word was said during the next three-quarters of an hour. Now the raft was passing before the distant town. Two or three glimmering lights showed where it lay, peacefully sleeping, beyond the vague, vast sweep of a star-gemmed water, unconscious of the tremendous event that was happening. The Black Avenger stood still with folded arms, looking his last upon the scene of his former joys and his later sufferings, and wishing she could see him now, abroad on the wild sea, facing peril and death with dauntless heart, going to his doom with a grim smile on his lips. It was but a small strain on his imagination to remove Jackson's Island beyond eyeshot of the village, and so he looked his last with a broken and satisfied heart. The other pirates were looking their last, too, and they all looked so long that they came near letting the current drift them out of the range of the island. But they discovered the danger in time, and made shift to avert it. About two o'clock in the morning the raft grounded on the bar two hundred yards above the head of the island, and they waded back and forth until they had landed their freight. Part of the little raft's belongings consisted of an old sail, and this they spread over a nook in the bushes for a tent to shelter their provisions but they themselves would sleep in the open air in good weather, as became outlaws. They built a fire against the side of a great log twenty or thirty steps within the somber depths of the forest, and then cooked some bacon in the frying-pan for supper, and used up half of the corn-pone stock they had brought. It seemed glorious sport to be feasting in that wild freeway in the virgin forest of an unexplored and uninhabited island, far from the haunts of men, and they said they never would return to civilization. The climbing fire lit up their faces, and threw its ruddy glare upon the pillared tree-trunks of their forest temple, and upon the varnished foliage and festooning vines. When the last crisp slice of bacon was gone, and the last allowance of corn-pone devoured, the boys stretched themselves out on the grass, filled with contentment. They could have found a cooler place, but they would not deny themselves such a romantic feature as the roasting campfire. "'Ain't it gay?' said Joe. "'It's nuts,' said Tom. "'What would the boys say if they could see us?' "'Say? Well, they'd just die to be here. Hey, Hucky?' "'I reckon so,' said Huckleberry. "'Anyways, I'm suited. I don't want nothing better than this. I don't ever get enough to eat, generally, 
and here they can't come and pick at a feller and bully-rag him so. "'It's just the life for me,' said Tom. "'You don't have to get up mornings, and you don't have to go to school and wash and all that blame foolishness. You see, a pirate don't have to do anything, Joe, when he's ashore, but a hermit, he has to be a-praying considerable, and, and then he don't have any fun, anyway, all by himself that way.' "'Oh, yes, that's so,' said Joe. "'But I hadn't thought much about it, you know. I'd a good deal rather be a pirate, now that I've tried it.' "'You see,' said Tom, "'people don't go much on hermits nowadays, like they used to in the old times. But a pirate's always respected, and a hermit's got to sleep on the hardest place he can find, and put sackcloth and ashes on his head, and stand out in the rain, and—' oh, "'What does he put sackcloth and ashes on his head for?' inquired Huck. "'I don't know, but they's got to do it. Hermits always do. You'd have to do that if you was a hermit.' "'Durned if I would,' said Huck. "'Well, what would you do?' I don't know, but I wouldn't do that. Why, Huck, you'd have to. How'd you get around it? Why, I just wouldn't stand it. I'd run away. Run away? Well, you would be a nice old slouch of a hermit. You'd be a disgrace. The red-handed made no response, being better employed. He had finished gouging out a cob, and now he fitted a weed stem to it, loaded it with tobacco, and was pressing a coal to the charge and blowing a cloud of fragrant smoke. He was in the full bloom of luxurious contentment. The other pirates envied him this majestic vice, and secretly resolved to acquire it shortly. Presently Huck said, "'What does pirates have to do?' Tom said, "'Oh, they have just a bully time. Take ships and burn them, and get the money, and bury it in awful places in their island, where there's ghosts and things to watch it, and kill everybody in the ships, and make them walk a plank.' "'And they carry the women to the island,' said Joe. They don't kill the women. No, assented Tom. They don't kill the women. They're too noble. And the women's always beautiful, too. And don't they wear the bulliest clothes? Oh, no, all gold and silver and diamonds, said Joe, with enthusiasm. Who? said Chuck. Why, the pirates. Huck scanned his own clothing forlornly. I reckon I ain't dressed fitting for a pirate, said he, with a regretful pathos in his voice. But I ain't got none of but these. But the other boys told him the fine clothes would come fast enough after they should have begun their adventures. They made him understand that his poor rags would do to begin with, though it was customary for wealthy pirates to start with a proper wardrobe. Gradually their talk died out, and drowsiness began to steal upon the eyelids of the little waifs. The pipe dropped from the fingers of the red-handed, and he slept the sleep of the conscience free and the weary. The terror of the seas and the black avenger of the Spanish main had more difficulty in getting to sleep. They said their prayers inwardly and lying down, since there was nobody there with authority to make them kneel and recite aloud. In truth, they had a mind not to say them at all, but they were afraid to proceed to such lengths at that, lest they might call down a sudden and special thunderbolt from heaven. Then at once they reached and hovered upon the imminent verge of sleep. But an intruder came, now, that would not down. It was conscience. They began to feel a vague fear that they had been doing wrong to run away, and next they thought of the stolen meat, and then the real torture came. They tried to argue it away by reminding Conscience that they had purloined sweetmeats and apple scores of times, but Conscience was not to be appeased by such thin plausibilities. It seemed to them, in the end, that there was no getting around the stubborn fact that taking sweetmeats was only hooking, while taking bacon and hams and such valuables was plain simple stealing. And there was a command against that in the Bible. So they inwardly resolved that so long as they remained in the business, their piracies should not again be sullied with a crime of stealing. Then conscience granted a truce and these curiously inconsistent pirates fell peacefully to sleep. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Happy Camp of the Freebooters When Tom awoke in the morning, he wondered where he was. He sat up and rubbed his eyes and looked around. Then he comprehended. It was the cool gray dawn, and there was a delicious sense of repose and peace in the deep, pervading calm and silence of the woods. Not a leaf stirred, not a sound obtruded upon great nature's meditation. Beaded dewdrops stood upon the leaves and grasses, a white layer of ashes covered the fire, and a thin blue breath of smoke rose straight into the air. Joe and Huck still slept. Now, far away in the woods, a bird called. Another answered. Presently the hammering of a woodpecker was heard. 
Gradually the cool, dim gray of the morning whitened, and as gradually sounds multiplied and life manifested itself. The marvel of nature shaking off sleep and going to work unfolded itself to the musing boy. A little green worm came crawling over a dewy leaf, lifting two-thirds of his body into the air from time to time and sniffing around, then proceeding again, for he was measuring, Tom said, and when the worm approached him, of its own accord, he sat as still as a stone, with his hopes rising and falling by turns, as the creature still came toward him, or seemed inclined to go elsewhere. And when at last it considered a painful moment with its curved body in the air, and then came decisively down upon Tom's leg, and began journeying over him, his whole heart was glad, for that meant that he was going to have a new suit of clothes, without the shadow of a doubt a gaudy piratical uniform. Now a procession of ants appeared, from nowhere in particular, and went about their labors. One struggled manfully by with a dead spider five times as big as itself in its arms, and lugged it straight up a tree-trunk. A brown-spotted ladybug climbed the dizzy height of a grass-blade, and Tom bent down close to it and said, "'Ladybug, ladybug, fly away home! Your house is on fire, your children's alone!' And she took wing and went off to see about it which did not surprise the boy, for he knew of old that this insect was credulous about conflagrations, and he had practiced upon its simplicity more than once. A tumble-bug came next, heaving sturdily at its ball, and Tom touched the creature to see it shut its legs against its body and pretend to be dead. The birds were fairly rioting by this time. A cat-bird, the northern mocker, lit in a tree over Tom's head, and trilled out her imitations of her neighbors in a rapture of enjoyment. Then a shrill jay swept down, a flash of blue flame, and stopped on a twig almost within the boy's reach, cocked his head to one side and eyed the strangers with a consuming curiosity. A gray squirrel and a big fellow of the fox kind came scurrying along, sitting up at intervals to inspect and chatter at the boys for the wild things had probably never seen a human being before, and scarcely knew whether to be afraid or not. All nature was wide awake and stirring now. Long lances of sunlight pierced down through the dense foliage far and near, and a few butterflies came fluttering upon the scene. Tom stirred up the other pirates, and they all clattered away with a shout, and in a minute or two were stripped, and chasing after and tumbling over each other in the shallow limpid water of the white sandbar. They felt no longing for the little village sleeping in the distance, beyond the majestic waste of water. A vagrant current, or a slight rise in the river, had carried off their raft, but this only gratified them, since its going was something like burning the bridge between them and civilization. They came back to camp, wonderfully refreshed, glad-hearted, and ravenous, and they soon had the campfire blazing up again. Huck found a spring of clear cold water close by, and the boys made cups of broad oak or hickory leaves, and felt that water, sweetened with such a wildwood charm as that, would be a good enough substitute for coffee. While Joe was slicing bacon for breakfast, Tom and Huck asked him to hold on a minute. They stepped to a promising nook in the river bank and threw in their lines. Almost immediately they had reward. Joe had not had time to get impatient before they were back again with some handsome bass, a couple of sun-perch, and a small catfish, provisions enough for quite a family. They fried the fish with the bacon, and were astonished, for no fish had ever seemed so delicious before. They did not know that the quicker a fresh-water fish is on the fire after it is caught, the better he is, and they reflected little upon what a sauce open-air sleeping, open-air exercise, bathing, and a large ingredient of hunger makes, too. They lay around in the shade after breakfast while Huck had a smoke, and then went off through the woods on an exploring expedition. They tramped gaily along over decaying logs, through tangled underbrush, among solemn monarchs of the forest, hung from their crowns to the ground with a drooping regalia of grapevines. Now and then they came upon snug nooks carpeted with grass and jewelled with flowers. They found plenty of things to be delighted with, but nothing to be astonished at. They discovered that the island was about three miles long and a quarter of a mile wide, and that the shore it lay closest to was only separated from it by a narrow channel hardly two hundred yards wide. They took a swim about every hour, so it was close upon the middle of the afternoon when they got back to the camp. 
They were too hungry to stop to fish, but they fared sumptuously upon cold ham, and then threw themselves down in the shade to talk. But the talk soon began to drag, and then died. The stillness, the solemnity that brooded in the woods, and the sense of loneliness, began to tell upon the spirits of the boys. They fell to thinking. A sort of undefined longing crept upon them. This took dim shape presently. It was budding homesickness. Even Finn, the red-handed, was dreaming of his doorsteps and empty hogsheads. But they were all ashamed of their weakness, and none was brave enough to speak his thought. For some time now the boys had been dully conscious of a particular sound in the distance, just as one sometimes is of the ticking of a clock which he takes no distinct note of. But now this mysterious sound became more pronounced and forced a recognition. The boys started, glanced at each other and then each assumed a listening attitude. There was a long silence, profound and unbroken, and then a deep, sullen boom came floating down out of the distance. "'What is it?' exclaimed Joe under his breath. "'I wonder,' said Tom in a whisper. "'Tain't thunder,' said Uncleberry in an awed tone. "'Cause thunder—' "'Hark!' said Tom. "'Listen, don't talk!' They waited a time that seemed an age, and then the same muffled boom troubled the solemn hush. Let's go and see." They sprang to their feet and hurried to the shore toward the town. They parted the bushes on the bank and peered out over the water. The little steam ferry-boat was about a mile below the village, drifting with the current. Her broad deck seemed crowded with people. There was a great many skiffs rowing about or floating with a stream in the neighborhood of the ferry-boat, but the boys could not determine what the men in them were doing. Presently a great jet of white smoke burst from the ferry-boat's side, and as it expanded and rose in a lazy cloud, that same dull throb of sound was borne to the listeners again. "'I know now!' exclaimed Tom. "'Somebody's drownded!' "'That's it,' said Huck. "'They'd done that last summer when Bill Turner got drownded. They shoot a cannon over the water, and that makes him come up to the top. Yes, and they take loaves of bread and put quicksilver in them and set them afloat, and wherever there's anybody that's drownded, they'll float right there and stop.' "'Yes, I've heard about that,' said Joe. "'I wonder what makes the bread do that.' "'Oh, it ain't the bread so much,' said Tom. "'I reckon it's mostly what they say over it before they start it out.' "'But they don't say anything over it,' said Huck. "'I've seen them, and they don't.' "'Well, that's funny,' said Tom. "'But maybe they say it to themselves. Of course they do. Anybody might know that.' The other boys agreed that there was reason in what Tom said, because an ignorant lump of bread uninstructed by an incantation could not be expected to act very intelligently when sent upon an errand of such gravity. "'By jings, I wish I was over there now,' said Joe. "'I do, too,' said Huck. "'I'd give heaps to know who it is.' The boys still listened and watched. Presently a revealing thought flashed through Tom's mind, and he exclaimed, "'Boys! I know who's drowned. It's us!' They felt like heroes in an instant. Here was a gorgeous triumph. They were missed. They were mourned. Hearts were breaking on their account. Tears were being shed. Accusing memories of unkindness to these poor lost lads were rising up, and unavailing regrets and remorse were being indulged. And best of all, the departed were the talk of the whole town, and the envy of all the boys, as far as this dazzling notoriety was concerned. This was fine. It was worth while to be a pirate after all. As twilight drew on, the ferry-boat went back to her accustomed business, and the skiffs disappeared. The pirates returned to camp. They were jubilant with vanity over their new grandeur and the illustrious trouble they were making. They caught fish, cooked supper, and ate it, and then fell to guessing at what the village was thinking and saying about them. And the pictures they drew of the public distress on their account were gratifying to look upon from their point of view. But when the shadows of night closed them in, they gradually ceased to talk, and sat gazing into the fire, with their minds evidently wandering elsewhere. The excitement was gone now, and Tom and Joe could not keep back thoughts of certain persons at home who were not enjoying this fine frolic as much as they were. Misgivings came. They grew troubled and unhappy. A sigh or two escaped unawares. By and by Joe timidly ventured upon a roundabout feeler as to how the others might look upon a return to civilization. Not right now, but, um— Tom withered him with derision. Huck, being uncommitted as yet, joined in with Tom, and the waverer quickly explained, 
and was glad to get out of the scrape with as little taint of chicken-hearted homesickness clinging to his garments as he could. Mutiny was effectually laid to rest for the moment. As the night deepened, Huck began to nod and presently to snore. Joe followed next. Tom lay upon his elbow motionless for some time, watching the two intently. At last he got up cautiously on his knees and went searching among the grass and the flickering reflections flung by the campfire. He picked up and inspected several large semi-cylinders of the thin white bark of a sycamore, and finally chose two which seemed to suit him. Then he knelt by the fire and painfully wrote something upon each of these with his red keel. One he rolled up and put in his jacket pocket, and the other he put in Joe's hat and removed it to a little distance from the owner, and he also put into the hat certain schoolboy treasures of almost inestimable value, among them a lump of chalk, an india-rubber ball, three fish-hooks, and one of that kind of marbles known as the sure-enough crystal. Then he tiptoed his way cautiously among the trees, till he felt that he was out of hearing, and straightway broke into a keen run in the direction of the sandbar. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 Tom's Stealthy Visit Home A few minutes later Tom was in the shoal water of the bar, wading toward the Illinois shore. Before the depth reached his middle he was halfway over. The current would permit no more wading now, so he struck out confidently to swim the remaining hundred yards. He swam quartering upstream, but still was swept downward rather faster than he had expected. However, he reached the shore finally, and drifted along till he found a low place and drew himself out. He put his hand on his jacket pocket, found his piece of bark safe, and then struck through the woods, following the shore with streaming garments. Shortly before ten o'clock he came out into an open place opposite the village, and saw the ferry-boat lying in the shadow of the trees and the high bank. Everything was quiet under the blinking stars. He crept down the bank, watching with all his eyes slipped into the water, swam three or four strokes, and climbed into the skiff that did yawl duty at the boat's stern. He laid himself down under the thwarps and waited, panting. Presently the cracked bell tapped, and a voice gave the order to cast off. A minute or two later the skiff's head was standing high up, against the boat's swell, and the voyage was begun. Tom felt happy in his success, for he knew it was the boat's last trip for the night. At the end of a long twelve or fifteen minutes the wheel stopped, and Tom slipped overboard and swam ashore in the dusk, landing fifty yards downstream, out of danger of possible stragglers. He flew along unfrequented alleys, and shortly found himself at his aunt's back fence. He climbed over, approached the L, and looked in at the sitting-room window, for a light was burning there. There sat Aunt Polly, Sid, Mary, and Joe Harper's mother, grouped together, talking. They were by the bed and the bed was between them and the door. Tom went to the door and began to softly lift the latch. Then he pressed gently, and the door yielded a crack. He continued pushing cautiously, and quaking every time it creaked, till he judged he might squeeze through on his knees. So he put his head through and began warily. "'What makes the candles blow so?' said Aunt Polly. Tom hurried up. "'Why, that door's open, I believe. Why, of course it is. No end of strange things now. Go along and shut it, Sid." Tom disappeared under the bed just in time. He lay and breathed himself for a while, then crept to where he could almost touch his aunt's foot. "'But as I was saying,' said Aunt Polly, "'he warn't bad, so to say, only mischievous, only just giddy and harum scarum, you know. He, he warn't any more responsible than a colt. He never meant any harm, and he was the best-hearted boy that ever was, and she began to cry. It was just so with my Joe, always full of his devilment and up to every kind of mischief, but he was just as unselfish and kind as he could be. And laws bless me to think I went and whipped him for taking that cream, never once recollecting that I throwed it out myself because it was sour, and I never to see him again in this world, never, 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 poor abused boy. And Mrs. Harper sobbed as if her heart would break. I hope Tom's better off where he is, said Sid but if he'd been better in some ways sid tom felt the glare of the old lady's eye though he could not see it not a word against my tom now that he's gone god'll take care of him never you trouble yourself sir oh mrs harper i don't know how to give him up i don't know how to give him up he was such a comfort to me although he tormented my old heart out of me most 
the Lord giveth and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But it's so hard, oh, it's so hard. Only last Saturday my Joe busted a firecracker right under my nose, and I knocked him sprawling. Little did I know then how soon, oh, if it was to do over again, I'd hug him and bless him for it. Yes, 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 I know just how you feel, Mrs. Harper. I know just exactly how you feel. No longer ago than yesterday noon, my Tom took and filled the cat full of painkiller, and I did think the creature would tear the house down. And God forgive me, I cracked Tom's head with my thimble. Poor boy, poor dead boy! But he's out of all his troubles now, and the last words I ever heard him say was to reproach. But this memory was too much for the old lady, and she broke entirely down. Tom was snuffling now himself, and more in pity of himself than anybody else. He could hear Mary crying, and putting in a kindly word for him from time to time. He began to have a nobler opinion of himself than ever before. Still, he was sufficiently touched by his aunt's grief to long to rush out from under the bed and overwhelm her with joy, and the theatrical gorgeousness of the thing appealed strongly to his nature, too. But he resisted, and lay still. He went on listening, and gathered by odds and ends that it was conjectured at first that the boys had got drowned while taking a swim. Then the small raft had been missed. Next certain boys said the missing lads had promised that the village should hear something soon. The wise heads had put this and that together, and decided that the lads had gone off on that raft, and would turn up at the next town below, presently. But toward noon the raft had been found, lodged against the Missouri shore some five or six miles below the village, and then hope perished. They must be drowned, else hunger would have driven them home by nightfall, if not sooner. It was believed that the search for the bodies had been a fruitless effort, merely because the drowning must have occurred in mid-channel, since the boys, being good swimmers, would otherwise have escaped to shore. This was Wednesday night. If the bodies continued missing until Sunday, all hope would be given over, and the funerals would be preached on that morning. Tom shuddered. Mrs. Harper gave a sobbing good-night and turned to go. Then, with a mutual impulse, the two bereaved women flung themselves into each other's arms and had a good, consoling cry, and then parted. Aunt Polly was tender far beyond her wont in her good night to Sid and Mary. Sid snuffled a bit, and Mary went off crying with all her heart. Aunt Polly knelt down and prayed for Tom so touchingly, so appealingly, and with such measureless love in her words and her old trembling voice, that he was weltering in tears again long before she was through. He had to keep still long after she went to bed, for she kept making broken-hearted ejaculations from time to time, tossing unrestfully and turning over. But at last she was still, only moaning a little in her sleep. Now the boy stole out, rose gradually from the bedside, shaded the candlelight with his hand, and stood regarding her. His heart was full of pity for her. He took out his sycamore scroll and placed it by the candle. But something occurred to him, and he lingered, considering. His face lighted with a happy solution of his thought. He put the bark hastily in his pocket. Then he bent over and kissed the faded lips, and straightway made his stealthy exit, latching the door behind him. He threaded his way back to the ferry landing, found nobody at large there, and walked boldly on board the boat, for he knew she was tenantless except that there was a watchman who always turned in and slept like a graven image. He untied the skiff at the stern, slipped into it, and was soon rowing cautiously upstream. When he had pulled a mile above the village, he started quartering across and bent himself stoutly to his work. He hit the landing on the other side neatly, for this was a familiar bit of work for him. He was moved to capture the skiff, arguing that it might be considered a ship and therefore a legitimate prey for a pirate, but he knew a thorough search would be made for it, and that might end in revelations. So he stepped ashore and entered the wood. He sat down and took a long rest, torturing himself meantime to keep awake, and then started warily down the home stretch. The night was far spent. It was broad daylight before he found himself fairly abreast the island bar. He rested again until the sun was well up and gilding the great river with its splendor, and then he plunged into the stream. A little later he paused, dripping upon the threshold of the camp, and heard Joe say, "'No, Tom's true blue, Huck. He'll come back. He won't desert. He knows that would be a disgrace to a pirate, and Tom's too proud for that sort of thing. He's up to something or other. I wonder what.' 
"'Well, the things is ours, anyway, ain't they?' "'Pretty near, but not yet, Huck. The writing says they are if he ain't back here to breakfast.' "'Which he is!' exclaimed Tom, with fine dramatic effect, stepping grandly into camp. A sumptuous breakfast of bacon and fish was shortly provided, and as the boys set to work upon it, Tom recounted, and adorned, his adventures. They were a vain and boastful company of heroes when the tale was done. Then Tom hid himself away in a shady nook to sleep till noon, and the other pirates got ready to fish and explore. End of chapter 15 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Chapter 16. First Pipes. I've Lost My Knife. After dinner, all the gang turned out to hunt for turtle eggs on the bar. They went about poking sticks into the sand, and when they found a soft place, they went down on their knees and dug with their hands. Sometimes they would take fifty or sixty eggs out of one hole. They were perfectly round, white things, a trifle smaller than an English walnut. They had a famous fried egg feast that night, and another on Friday morning. After breakfast they went whooping and prancing out on the bar, and chased each other round and round, shedding clothes as they went, until they were naked, and then continued the frolic far away up the shoal water of the bar against the stiff current, which latter tripped their legs from under them from time to time, and greatly increased the fun. And now and then they stooped in a group and splashed water in each other's faces with their palms, gradually approaching each other with averted faces to avoid the strangling sprays, and finally gripping and struggling till the best man ducked his neighbor, and then they all went under in a tangle of white legs and arms, and came up blowing, sputtering, laughing, and gasping for breath at one and the same time. When they were well exhausted, they would run out and sprawl on the dry, hot sand, and lie there and cover themselves up with it, and by and by break from the water again and go through the original performance once more. Finally it occurred to them that their naked skin represented flesh-colored tights very fairly, so they drew a ring in the sand and had a circus, with three clowns in it, for none would yield this proudest post to his neighbor. Next they got their marbles and played knucks and ring-taw and keeps, till that amusement grew stale. Then Joe and Huck had another swim, but Tom would not venture, because he found that in kicking off his trousers he had kicked his string of rattlesnake rattles off his ankle, and he wondered how he had escaped cramp so long without the protection of this mysterious charm. He did not venture again until he had found it, and by that time the other boys were tired and ready to rest. They gradually wandered apart, and dropped into the dumps, and fell to gazing longingly across the wide river to where the village lay drowsing in the sun. Tom found himself writing Becky in the sand with his big toe. He scratched it out and was angry with himself for his weakness. But he wrote it again, nevertheless. He could not help it. He erased it once more, and then took himself out of temptation by driving the other boys together and joining them. But Joe's spirits had gone down almost beyond resurrection. He was so homesick that he could hardly endure the misery of it. The tears lay very near the surface. Huck was melancholy, too. Tom was downhearted, but tried hard not to show it. He had a secret, which he was not ready to tell yet, but if this mutinous depression was not broken up soon, he would have to bring it out. He said, with a great show of cheerfulness, I bet there's been pirates on this island before, boys. We'll explore it again. They've hid treasures here somewhere. How'd you feel to light on a rotten chest full of gold and silver, hey? But it roused only a faint enthusiasm, which faded out with no reply. Tom tried one or two other seductions, but they failed, too. It was discouraging work. Joe sat poking up the sand with a stick and looking very gloomy. Finally he said, Oh, boys, let's give it up. I want to go home. It's so lonesome. Oh, no, Joe, you'll feel better by and by, said Tom. Just think of the fishing that's here. I don't care for fishing. I want to go home. But, Joe, there ain't such another swimming place anywhere. Swimming's no good. I don't seem to care for it, somehow, when there ain't anybody to say I shan't go in. I mean to go home. Oh, shucks, baby. You want to see your mother, I reckon. Yes, I do want to see my mother. And you would, too, if you had one. 
I ain't any more baby than you are." And Joe snuffled a little. "'Well, we'll let the crybaby go home to his mother, won't we, Huck?' "'Poor thing! Does it want to see its mother? And so it shall. You like it here, don't you, Huck? We'll stay, won't we?' Huck said, "'Yes,' without any heart in it. "'I'll never speak to you again as long as I live,' said Joe, rising. "'There, now!' And he moved moodily away and began to dress himself. "'Who cares?' said Tom. "'Nobody wants you to. Go long home and get laughed at. Oh, you're a nice pirate. Huck and me ain't crybabies. We'll stay, won't we, Huck? Let him go if he wants to. I reckon we can get along without him, perhaps.' But Tom was uneasy, nevertheless, and was alarmed to see Joe go sullenly on with his dressing. And then it was discomforting to see Huck eyeing Joe's preparations so wistfully, and keeping up such an ominous silence. Presently, without a parting word, Joe began to wade off toward the Illinois shore. Tom's heart began to sink. He glanced at Huck. Huck could not bear the look, and dropped his eyes. And then he said, "'I want to go, too, Tom. It was getting so lonesome anyway, and now it'll be worse. Let's us go, too, Tom.' "'I won't. You can all go if you want to. I mean to stay.' "'Tom, I'd better go.' "'Well, go along. Who's hindering you?' Huck began to pick up his scattered clothes, and he said, "'Tom, I wish you'd come, too. Now you think it over. We'll, we'll wait for you when we get to the shore.' "'Well, you'll wait a blame long time, that's all.' Huck started sorrowfully away, and Tom stood looking after him, with a strong desire tugging at his heart to yield his pride and go along, too. He hoped the boys would stop, but they still waited slowly on. It suddenly dawned on Tom that it was become very lonely and still. He made one final struggle with his pride, and then darted after his comrades, yelling, "'Wait! Wait! I want to tell you something!' They presently stopped and turned around. When he got to where they were, he began unfolding his secret, and they listened moodily, till at last they saw the point he was driving at. And then they set up a war-whoop of applause, and said it was splendid, and said if he had told them at first, they wouldn't have started away. He made a plausible excuse but his real reason had been the fear that not even the secret would keep them with him any very great length of time, and so he had meant to hold it in reserve as a last seduction. The lads came gaily back and went at their sports again with a will, chattering all the time about Tom's stupendous plan and admiring the genius of it. After a dainty egg and fish dinner, Tom said he wanted to learn to smoke now. Joe caught at the idea and said he would like to try, too. So Huck made pipes and filled them. These novices had never smoked anything before but cigars made of grapevine, and they bit the tongue and were not considered manly anyway. Now they stretched themselves out on their elbows and began to puff, charily and with slender confidence. The smoke had an unpleasant taste, and they gagged a little, but Tom said, "'Why, it's just as easy. If I'd a knowed this was all, I'd a learned long ago.' "'So would I,' said Joe. "'It's just nothing. Why, many a time I've looked at people smoking and thought, well, I wish I could do that, but I never thought I could,' said Tom. "'That's just the way with me, ain't it, Huck? You've heard me talk just that way, haven't you, Huck? I'll leave it to Huck if I haven't.' "'Yes, heaps of times,' said Huck. "'Well, I have, too,' said Tom. "'Oh, hundreds of times. Once down by the slaughterhouse, don't you remember, Huck? Bob Tanner was there, and Johnny Miller, and Jeff Thatcher, when I said it.' "'Don't you remember, Huck, about me saying that?' "'Yes, that's so,' said Huck. "'That was the day after I lost a white alley. No, twas the day before.' "'There, I told you so,' said Tom. "'Huck recollects it.' "'I believe I could smoke this pipe all day,' said Joe. "'I don't feel sick.' "'Neither do I,' said Tom. "'I could smoke it all day. But I bet you Jeff Thatcher couldn't.' "'Jeff Thatcher? Why, he'd keel over just with two draws. Just let him try it once. He'd see.' I bet he would. And Johnny Miller, I wish I could see Johnny Miller tackle it once. Oh, don't I, said Joe. Why, I bet now Johnny Miller couldn't any more do this than nothing. Just one little snifter would fetch him. Deed it would, Joe. Say, I, I wish the boys could see us now. So do I. Say, boys, don't say anything about it, and sometime when they're around I'll come up to you and say, Joe, got a pipe? I want to smoke. And you'll say, kind of careless-like, as if it weren't anything, you'll say, "'Yes, I, I got my old pipe, and another one, but my tobacco ain't very good.' And I'll say, "'Oh, that's all right, if it's strong enough.' And then you'll out with the pipes, and we'll light up just as calm, and, and then just see em look. 
"'By jings, that'll be gay, Tom. I wish it was now.' "'So do I. And when we tell em we learned when we was off pirating, won't they wish they'd been along?' "'Oh, I reckon not. I'll just bet they will.' So the talk ran on. But presently it began to flag a trifle and grow disjointed. The silences widened, the expectoration marvelously increased. Every pore inside the boys' cheeks became a spouting fountain. They could scarcely bail out the cellars under their tongues fast enough to prevent an inundation. Little overflowings down their throats occurred in spite of all they could do, and sudden retchings followed every time. Both boys were looking very pale and miserable now. Joe's pipe dropped from his nerveless fingers. Tom's followed. Both fountains were going furiously, and both pumps bailing with might and main. Joe said feebly, "'I've lost my knife. I reckon I'd better go and find it.' Tom said with quivering lips and halting utterance, "'I'll help you. You go over that way, and I'll hunt around by the spring. No, you, you needn't come, Huck. We can find it.' So Huck sat down again and waited an hour. Then he found it lonesome and went to find his comrades. They were wide apart in the woods, both very pale, both fast asleep. But something informed him that if they had had any trouble they had got rid of it. They were not talkative at supper that night. They had a humble look, and when Huck prepared his pipe after the meal and was going to prepare theirs, they said, no, they were not feeling very well. Something they ate at dinner had disagreed with them. About midnight Joe woke and called the boys. There was a brooding oppressiveness in the air that seemed to bode something. The boys huddled themselves together and sought the friendly companionship of the fire, though the dull, dead heat of the breathless atmosphere was stifling. They sat still, intent, and waiting. The solemn hush continued. Beyond the light of the fire everything was swallowed up in the blackness of darkness. Presently there came a quivering glow that vaguely revealed the foliage for a moment, and then vanished. By and by another came, a little stronger, then another. Then a faint moan came sighing through the branches of the forest, and the boys felt a fleeting breath upon their cheeks, and shuddered with a fancy that the spirit of the night had gone by. There was a pause. Now a weird flash turned night into day, and showed every little grass-blade, separate and distinct, and grew about their feet, and it showed three white startled faces, too. A deep peal of thunder went rolling and tumbling down the heavens, and lost itself in sullen rumblings in the distance. A sweep of chilly air passed by, rustling all the leaves and snowing the flaky ashes broadcast about the fire. Another fierce glare lit up the forest, and an instant crash followed that seemed to rend the treetops right over the boys' heads. They clung together in terror in the thick gloom that followed. A few big raindrops fell, pattering upon the leaves. "'Quick, boys, go for the tent!' exclaimed Tom. They sprang away, stumbling over the roots and among vines in the dark, no two plunging in the same direction. A furious blast roared through the trees, making everything sing as it went. One blinding flash after another, and the peal on peal of deafening thunder. And now a drenching rain poured down, and the rising hurricane drove it in sheets along the ground. The boys cried out to each other, but the roaring wind and the booming thunder-blast drowned their voices utterly. However, one by one they straggled in at last and took shelter under the tent, cold, scared, and streaming with water. But to have company in misery seemed something to be grateful for. They could not talk, the old sail flapped so furiously, even if the other noises would have allowed them. The tempest rose higher and higher, and presently the sail tore loose from its fastenings and went winging away on the blast. The boys seized each other's hands and fled, with many tumblings and bruises, to the shelter of a great oak-tree that stood upon the river-bank. Now the battle was at its highest. Under the ceaseless conflagration of lightning that flamed in the skies, everything below stood out in clean-cut and shadowless distinction. The bending trees, the billowy river, white with foam, the driving spray of spume-flakes, the dim outlines of the high bluffs on the other side glimpsed through the drifting cloud-rack and the slanting veil of rain. Every little while some giant tree yielded the fight and fell crashing through the younger growth, and the unflagging thunder-peals came now in ear-splitting explosive bursts, keen and sharp and unspeakably appalling. The storm culminated in one matchless effort that seemed likely to tear the island to pieces, burn it up, drown it to the tree-tops, and blow it away, and deafen every creature in it all at once at the same moment. 
it was a wild night for homeless young heads to be out in. But at last the battle was done, and the forces retired with weaker and weaker threatenings and grumblings, and peace resumed her sway. The boys went back to camp, a good deal awed, but they found there was still something to be thankful for, because the great sycamore, the shelter of their beds, was a ruin now, blasted by the lightnings, and they were not under it when the catastrophe happened. Everything in camp was drenched, the campfire as well, for they were but heedless lads, like their generation, and had made no provision against rain. Here was matter for dismay, for they were soaked through and chilled. They were eloquent in their distress, but they presently discovered that the fire had eaten so far up under the great log it had been built against, where it curved upward and separated itself from the ground, that a hand-breadth or so of it had escaped wetting. So they patiently wrought, until, with shreds and bark gathered from under sides of sheltered logs, they coaxed the fire to burn again. Then they piled on great dead boughs till they had a roaring furnace, and were glad-hearted once more. They dried their boiled ham and had a feast, and after that they sat by the fire and expanded and glorified their midnight adventure until morning, for there was not a dry spot to sleep on anywhere around. As the sun began to steal in upon the boys, drowsiness came over them, and they went out on the sandbar and lay down to sleep. They got scorched out by and by, and drearily set about getting breakfast. After the meal they felt rusty and stiff-jointed and a little homesick once more. Tom saw the signs, and fell to cheering up the pirates as well as he could. But they cared nothing for marbles or circus or swimming or anything. He reminded them of the imposing secret and raised a ray of cheer. While at last he got them interested in a new device. This was to knock off being pirates for a while and be Indians for a change. They were attracted by this idea, so it was not long before they were stripped and striped from head to heel with black mud like so many zebras, all of them chiefs, of course, and then they went tearing through the woods to attack an English settlement. By and by they separated into three hostile tribes, and darted upon each other from ambush with dreadful war-whoops, and killed and scalped each other by thousands. It was a gory day. Consequently it was an extremely satisfactory one. They assembled in camp towards supper-time, hungry and happy. But now a difficulty arose. Hostile Indians could not break the bread of hospitality together without first making peace, and this was a simple impossibility without smoking a pipe of peace. There was no other process that they ever had heard of. Two of the savages almost wished they had remained pirates. However, there was no other way. So, with such show of cheerfulness as they could muster, they called for the pipe, and took their whiff as it passed in due form. And, behold, they were glad they had gone into savagery, for they had gained something. They found that they could now smoke a little without having to go and hunt for a lost knife. They did not get sick enough to be seriously uncomfortable. They were not likely to fool away this high promise for lack of effort. No, they practiced cautiously, after supper with right fair success, and so they spent a jubilant evening. They were prouder and happier in their new acquirement than they would have been in the scalping and skinning of the six nations. We will leave them to smoke and chatter and brag, since we have no further use for them at present. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 Pirates at Their Own Funeral but there was no hilarity in the little town that same tranquil Saturday afternoon. The Harpers and Aunt Polly's family were being put into mourning, with great grief and many tears. An unusual quiet possessed the village, although it was ordinarily quiet enough in all conscience. The villagers conducted their concerns with an absent mind and talked little, but they sighed often. The Saturday holiday seemed a burden to the children. They had no heart in their sports and gradually gave them up. In the afternoon Becky Thatcher found herself moping about the deserted schoolhouse yard, and feeling very melancholy, but she found nothing there to comfort her. She soliloquized, "'Oh, if I only had a brass andiron knob again! But I haven't got anything now to remember him by!' And she choked back a little sob. Presently she stopped and said to herself, "'It was right here. Oh, if it was to do over again, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say it for the whole world!' but he's gone now. I'll never, never, never see him any more." This thought broke her down, and she wandered away, with the tears rolling down her cheeks. 
Then quite a group of boys and girls, playmates of Tom's and Joe's, came by, and stood looking over the paling fence, and talking in reverent tones of how Tom did so-and-so the last time they saw him, and how Joe said this and that small trifle, pregnant with awful prophecy, as they could easily see now, and each speaker pointed out the exact spot where the lost lad stood at the time, and then added something like, "'And I was a-standing just so, just, just as I am now, and as if you was him, I was as close as that, and, and he smiled just this way, and then something seemed to go all over me, like awful, you know, and, and I never thought what it meant, of course, I, but, but I can see now." Then there was a dispute about who saw the dead boys last in life, and many claimed that dismal distinction, and offered evidences more or less tampered with by the witness. And when it was ultimately decided who did see the departed last, and exchanged the last words with them, the lucky parties took upon themselves a sort of sacred importance, and were gaped at and envied by all the rest. One poor chap, who had no other grandeur to offer, said with tolerably manifest pride in the remembrance, "'Well, Tom Sawyer, he licked me once.' But that bid for glory was a failure. Most of the boys could say that, and so that cheapened the distinction too much. The group loitered away, still recalling memories of the lost heroes in awed voices. When the Sunday school hour was finished the next morning, the bell began to toll instead of ringing in the usual way. It was a very still Sabbath, and the mournful sound seemed in keeping with the musing hush that lay upon nature. The villagers began to gather, loitering a moment in the vestibule to converse in whispers about the sad event. But there was no whispering in the house only the funereal rustling of dresses, as the women gathered to their seats, disturbed the silence there. None could remember when the little church had been so full before. There was finally a waiting pause, an expectant dumbness, and then Aunt Polly entered, followed by Sid and Mary, and they by the Harper family, all in deep black, and the whole congregation, the old minister as well, rose reverently and stood, until the mourners were seated in the front pew. There was another communing silence, broken at intervals by muffled sobs, and then the minister spread his hands abroad and prayed. A moving hymn was sung, and the text followed, I am the resurrection and the life. As the service proceeded, the clergyman drew such pictures of the graces, the winning ways, and the rare promise of the lost lads, that every soul there, thinking he recognized these pictures, felt a pang in remembering that he had persistently blinded himself to them always before, and had as persistently seen only faults and flaws in the poor boys. The minister related many a touching incident in the lives of the departed, too, which illustrated their sweet, generous natures, and the people could easily see now how noble and beautiful those episodes were, and remembered with grief that at the time they occurred they had seemed rank rascalities well deserving of the cowhide. The congregation became more and more moved as the pathetic tale went on, till at last the whole company broke down and joined the weeping mourners in a chorus of anguished sobs, the preacher himself giving way to his feelings and crying in the pulpit. There was a rustle in the gallery which nobody noticed. A moment later the church door creaked. The minister raised his streaming eyes above his handkerchief and stood transfixed. First one, and another pair of eyes followed the minister's, and then almost with one impulse the congregation rose and stared while the three dead boys came marching up the aisle, Tom in the lead, Joe next, and Huck, a ruin of drooping rags, sneaking sheepishly in the rear. They had been hid in the unused gallery, listening to their own funeral sermon. Aunt Polly, Mary, and the Harpers threw themselves upon their restored ones, smothered them with kisses, and poured out thanksgivings, while poor Huck stood abashed and uncomfortable, not knowing exactly what to do or where to hide from so many unwelcoming eyes. He wavered and started to slink away, but Tom seized him and said, "'Aunt Polly, it ain't fair. Somebody's got to be glad to see Huck.' "'And so they shall. I'm glad to see him, poor motherless thing.' and the loving attentions Aunt Polly lavished upon him were the one thing capable of making him more uncomfortable than he was before. Suddenly the minister shouted at the top of his voice, "'Praise God, from whom all blessings flow! Sing, and put your hearts in it!' And they did. 
old hundred swelled up with a triumphant burst, and while it shook the rafters, Tom Sawyer the pirate looked around upon the envying juveniles about him, and confessed in his heart that this was the proudest moment of his life. As the sold congregation trooped out, they said they would almost be willing to be made ridiculous again to hear old hundred sung like that once more. Tom got more cuffs and kisses that day, according to Aunt Polly's varying moods, than he had earned before in a year, and he hardly knew which expressed the most gratefulness to God and affection for himself. End of chapter 17 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain Chapter 18 Tom Reveals His Dream Secret That was Tom's great secret, the scheme to return home with his brother pirates and attend their own funerals. They had paddled over to the Missouri shore on a log at dusk on Saturday, landing five or six miles below the village. They had slept in the woods at the edge of the town till nearly daylight, and had then crept through back lanes and alleys, and finished their sleep in the gallery of the church among a chaos of invalided benches. At breakfast Monday morning Aunt Polly and Mary were very loving to Tom, and very attentive to his wants. There was an unusual amount of talk. In the course of it Aunt Polly said, well, I don't say it wasn't a fine joke, Tom, to keep everybody suffering most a week so you boys had a good time, but it is a pity you could be so hard-hearted as to let me suffer so. If you could have come over on a log to go to your funeral, you could have come over and give me a hint some way that you weren't dead but only run off. Yes, you could have done that, Tom, said Mary, and I believe you would if you had thought of it. Would you, Tom? said Aunt Polly, her face lightening wistfully. Say, now, would you, if you'd thought of it? I—well, I don't know. T'would have spoiled everything." "'Tom, I hoped you loved me that much,' said Aunt Polly, with a grieved tone that discomforted the boy. "'It would have been something if you'd cared enough to think of it, even if you didn't do it.' "'Now, Auntie, that ain't any harm,' pleaded Mary. "'It's only Tom's giddy way. He's always in such a rush that he never thinks of anything.' "'More's the pity,' Sid would have thought and Sid would have come and done it, too. Tom, you'll look back some day, when it's too late, and wish you'd cared a little more for me, when it would have cost you so little." "'Now, Auntie, you know I do care for you,' said Tom. "'I'd know it better if you acted more like it.' "'I wish now I'd thought,' said Tom, with a repentant tone. "'But I dreamed about you, anyway. That's something, ain't it?' "'It ain't much. A cat does that much. But it's better than nothing. What did you dream?' Why, Wednesday night I dreamt that you was sitting over there by the bed, and Sid was sitting by the wood-box, and Mary next to him. Well, so we did. So we always do. I'm glad your dreams could take even that much trouble about us. And I dreamt that Joe Harper's mother was here. Why, she was here. Did you dream any more? Oh, lots, but it's so dim now. Well, try to recollect, can't you? Somehow it seems to me that the wind, the wind blowed, the, the— Try harder, Tom. The wind did blow something. Come. Tom pressed his fingers to his forehead an anxious minute, and then said, I've got it now. I've got it now. It blowed the candle. Mercy on us. Go on, Tom. Go on. And it seems to me that you said, Why, I believe that that door— Go on, Tom. Just let me study a moment. Just, just a moment. Oh, yes. You said you believed the door was open. As I'm sitting here, I did. Didn't I, Mary? Go on. And then, and then, well, I won't be certain, but it seems like, like as if you made Sid go and, and, well, well, what did I make him do, Tom? What did I make him do? You made him, you, oh, you made him shut it. Well, for land's sake, I never heard the beat of that in all my days. Don't tell me there ain't anything in dreams any more. Serenity Harper shall know of this before I'm an hour older. I'd like to see her get around this with her rubbish about superstition. Go on, Tom. Oh, it's all getting just as bright as day now. Next you said I weren't bad, only mischievous and harem scarum, and not any more responsible than—I than, think it was a colt or something. And so it was. 
"'Well, goodness gracious, go on, Tom.' "'And then you began to cry.' "'So I did, so I did. Not the first time, neither. And then?' But then Mrs. Harper, she began to cry, and said Joe was just the same, and she wished she hadn't whipped him for taking cream when she'd throwed it out of her own self. Tom, the spirit was upon you. You was a prophesying. That's what you was a-doing. Land alive. Go on, Tom. Well, then Sid, he said, he said, well, I don't think I said anything, said Sid. Yes, you did, Sid, said Mary. Shut your heads and let Tom go. What did he say, Tom? He said, well, I think he said he hoped I was better off where I was gone to, but if I'd been better sometimes— There, do you hear that? It was his very words. And you shut him up sharp. I lay I did. There must have been an angel there. There was an angel there somewheres. And Mrs. Harper told about Joe scaring her with a firecracker, and you told about Peter and the painkiller, just as true as I live. And then there was a whole lot of talk about dragging the river for us, and about having the funeral Sunday, and then you and old Miss Harper hugged and cried, and she went. It happened just so. It happened just so, as sure as I'm sitting in these very tracks. Tom, you couldn't have told it more like if you'd a seen it. And then what? Go on, Tom. Well, then I thought you prayed for me, and I, I could see you and hear every word you said, and you went to bed and I was so sorry that I took and wrote on a piece of sycamore bark, we ain't dead, we are only off being pirates, and put it on the table by the candle, and then you looked so good laying there asleep that I thought I went and leaned over and kissed you on the lips. Did you, Tom? Did you? I just forgive you everything for that. And she seized the boy in a crushing embrace that made him feel like the guiltiest of villains. It was very kind, even though it was only— a dream, Sid soliloquized, just audibly. Shut up, Sid. A body does just the same in a dream as he'd do if he was awake. Here's a big Milam apple I've been saving for you, Tom, if you was ever found again. Now go along to school. I'm thankful to the good God and Father of us all I've got you back. That's long suffering and merciful to them that believe on him and keep his word, though goodness knows I'm unworthy of it. But if only the worthy ones got his blessings, and had his hand to help them over the rough places, there's few enough would smile here or ever enter into his rest when the long night comes. Go long, Sid, Mary, Tom. Take yourselves off. You've hindered me long enough. The children left for school, and the old lady to call on Mrs. Harper, and vanquish her realism with Tom's marvellous dream. Sid had better judgment than to utter the thought that was in his mind as he left the house. It was this. Pretty thin, as long as a dream is that, without any mistakes in it. What a hero Tom was become now! He did not go skipping and prancing, but moved with a dignified swagger as became a pirate who felt that the public eye was on him. And indeed it was. He tried not to seem to see the looks or hear the remarks as he passed along, but they were food and drink to him. Smaller boys than himself flocked at his heels, as proud to be seen with him and tolerated by him, as if he had been the drummer at the head of a procession, or the elephant leading a menagerie into town. Boys of his own size pretended not to know he had been away at all, but they were consuming with envy nevertheless. They would have given anything to have had that swarthy sun-tanned skin of his, and his glittering notoriety, and Tom would not have parted with either for a circus. At school the children made so much of him and of Joe, and delivered such eloquent admiration from their eyes, that the two heroes were not long in becoming insufferably stuck up. They began to tell their adventures to hungry listeners, but they only began. It was not a thing likely to have an end with imaginations like theirs to furnish material. And finally, when they got out their pipes and went serenely puffing around, the very summit of glory was reached. Tom decided that he could be independent of Becky Thatcher now. Glory was sufficient. He would live for glory. Now that he was distinguished, maybe she would be wanting to make up. Well, let her. She should see that he could be as indifferent as some other people. Presently she arrived. Tom pretended not to see her. He moved away and joined a group of boys and girls and began to talk. Soon he observed that she was tripping gaily back and forth with flushed face and dancing eyes, pretending to be busy chasing schoolmates, and screaming with laughter when she made a capture. But he noticed that she always made her captures in his vicinity, and that she seemed to cast a conscious eye in his direction at such times, too. It gratified all the vicious vanity that was in him, 
and so, instead of winning him, it only set him up the more, and made him the more diligent to avoid betraying that he knew she was about. Presently she gave over skylarking, and moved irresolutely about, sighing once or twice, and glancing furtively and wistfully toward Tom. Then she observed that now Tom was talking more particularly to Amy Lawrence than to any one else. She felt a sharp pang, and grew disturbed and uneasy at once. She tried to go away, but her feet were treacherous, and carried her to the group instead. She said to a girl almost at Tom's elbow, with sham vivacity, "'Why, Mary Austin, you bad girl, why didn't you come to Sunday school?' "'I did come. Didn't you see me?' "'Why, no. Did you? Where did you sit?' "'I was in Miss Peters' class, where I always go. I saw you.' "'Did you? Why, it's funny, I didn't see you. I wanted to tell you about the picnic.' "'Oh, that's jolly. Who's going to give it?' "'My ma's going to let me have one.' "'Oh, goody! I hope she'll let me come.' "'Well, she will. The picnic's for me.' She'll let anybody come that I want, and I want you. That's ever so nice. When is it going to be? By and by. Maybe about vacation. Oh, won't it be fun? You going to have all the girls and boys? Yes, every one that's friends to me, or wants to be. And she glanced ever so furtively at Tom. But he talked right along to Amy Lawrence about the terrible storm on the island, and how the lightning tore the great sycamore tree all to flinders while he was standing within three feet of it. "'Oh, may I come?' said Gracie Miller. "'Yes.' "'And me?' said Sally Rogers. "'Yes.' "'And me, too?' said Susie Harper. "'And Joe?' "'Yes.' And so on, with clapping of joyful hands, till all the group had begged for invitations but Tom and Amy. Then Tom turned coolly away, still talking, and took Amy with him. Becky's lips trembled, and the tears came to her eyes. She hid these signs with a forced gaiety, and went on chattering, but the life had gone out of the picnic now, and out of everything else. She got away as soon as she could, and hid herself, and had what her sex call a good cry. Then she sat moody, with wounded pride, till the bell rang. She roused up now, with a vindictive cast in her eye, and gave her plated tails a shake, and said she knew what she'd do. At recess Tom continued his flirtation with Amy with jubilant self-satisfaction and he kept drifting about to find Becky and lacerate her with the performance. At last he spied her, but there was a sudden falling of his mercury. She was sitting cosily on a little bench behind the schoolhouse looking at a picture-book with Alfred Temple, and so absorbed were they, and their heads so close together over the book, that they did not seem to be conscious of anything in the world besides. Jealousy ran red-hot through Tom's veins. He began to hate himself for throwing away the chance Becky had offered for a reconciliation. He called himself a fool, and all the hard names he could think of. He wanted to cry with vexation. Amy chatted happily along as they walked, for her heart was singing, but Tom's tongue had lost its function. He did not hear what Amy was saying, and whenever she paused expectantly he could only stammer an awkward assent, which was as often misplaced as otherwise. He kept drifting to the rear of the schoolhouse again and again to sear his eyeballs with a hateful spectacle there. He could not help it and it maddened him to see, as he thought he saw, that Becky Thatcher never once suspected that he was even in the land of the living. But she did see, nevertheless, and she knew she was winning her fight, too, and was glad to see him suffer as she had suffered. Amy's happy prattle became intolerable. Tom hinted at things he had to attend to, things that must be done, and time was fleeting. But in vain the girl chirped on. Tom thought, "'Oh, hang her! Ain't I ever going to get rid of her?' At last he must be attending to those things, and she said artlessly that she would be around when school left out, and he hastened away, hating her for it. Any other boy, Tom thought, grating his teeth, any boy in the whole town but that St. Louis smarty that thinks he dresses so fine and is aristocracy. Oh, all right, I licked you the first day you ever saw this town, mister, and I'll lick you again. You just wait till I catch you out. I'll just take and— and he went through the motions of thrashing an imaginary boy, pummeling the air and kicking and gouging. "'Oh, you do, do you? You holler enough, do you? Now, then, let that learn you!' And so the imaginary flogging was finished to his satisfaction. Tom fled home at noon. His conscience could not endure any more of Amy's grateful happiness, and his jealousy could bear no more of the other distress. Becky resumed her picture inspections with Alfred, but as the minutes dragged along and no Tom came to suffer, her triumph began to cloud and she lost interest. Gravity and absent-mindedness followed, and then melancholy. 
Two or three times she pricked up her ear at a footstep, but it was a false hope. No Tom came. At last she grew entirely miserable, and wished she hadn't carried it so far. When poor Alfred, seeing that he was losing her, he did not know how, kept exclaiming, "'Oh, here's a jolly one! Look at this!' She lost patience at last, and said, "'Oh, don't bother me! I, I don't care for them!' and burst into tears, and got up and walked away. Alfred dropped alongside and was going to try to comfort her, but she said, "'Go away and leave me alone, can't you? I hate you!' So the boy halted, wondering what he could have done, for she had said she would look at pictures all through the nooning, and she walked on crying. Then Alfred went musing into the deserted schoolhouse. He was humiliated and angry. He easily guessed his way to the truth. The girl had simply made a convenience of him, to vent her spite upon Tom Sawyer. He was far from hating Tom the less when this thought occurred to him. He wished there was some way to get that boy into trouble without much risk to himself. Tom's spelling-book fell under his eye. Here was his opportunity. He gratefully opened to the lesson for the afternoon and poured ink upon the page. Becky, glancing in at a window behind him at the moment, saw the act and moved on without discovering herself. She started homeward now, intending to find Tom and tell him. Tom would be thankful and their troubles would be healed. Before she was halfway home, however, she had changed her mind. The thought of Tom's treatment of her when she was talking about her picnic came scorching back and filled her with shame. She resolved to let him get whipped on the damaged spelling-book's account, and to hate him forever into the bargain. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 The Cruelty of I Didn't Think Tom arrived at home in a dreary mood, and the first thing his aunt said to him showed him that he had brought his sorrows to an unpromising market. "'Tom, I've a notion to skin you alive.' "'Auntie, what have I done?' "'Well, you've done enough. Here I go over to Serenity Harper, like an old softy, expecting I'm going to make her believe all that rubbish about that dream, when, lo and behold you, she'd found out from Joe that you was over here and heard all the talk we had that night. Tom, I don't know what is to become of a boy that will act like that. It makes me feel so bad to think that you could let me go to Serenity Harper and make such a fool of myself, and never say a word." This was a new aspect of the thing. His smartness of the morning had seemed to Tom a good joke before, and very ingenious. It merely looked mean and shabby now. He hung his head and could not think of anything to say for a moment. Then he said, "'Auntie, I wished I hadn't done it, but I didn't think.' "'Oh, child, you never think. You never think of anything but your own selfishness. You could think to come all the way over here from Jackson's Island in the night to laugh at our troubles, and you could think to fool me with a lie about a dream, but you couldn't ever think to pity us and save us from sorrow. Auntie, I know now it was mean, but I didn't mean it to be mean. I didn't, honest. And besides, I didn't come over here to laugh at you that night. What did you come for, then?' It was to tell you not to be uneasy about us, because we hadn't got drowned. Tom, Tom, I would be the thankfulest soul in this world if I could believe you ever had as good a thought as that. But you know you never did, and I know it, Tom. Indeed, indeed, I did, Addy. I, I wish I may never stir if I didn't. Oh, Tom, don't lie. Don't do it. It only makes things a hundred times worse. It ain't a lie, Addy. It's the truth. I wanted to keep you from grieving. That was all that made me come. I'd give the whole world to believe that. It would cover up a power of sins, Tom. I'd most be glad you'd run off and acted so bad. But it ain't reasonable. Because why didn't you tell me, child? Why, you see, when you got to talking about the funeral, I just got all full of the idea of our coming and hiding in the church, and I couldn't somehow bear to spoil it. So I just put the bark back in my pocket and kept mum. What bark? the bark I wrote on to tell you we'd gone pirating. I wish now you'd waked up when I kissed you. I do honest." The hard lines in his aunt's face relaxed, and a sudden tenderness dawned in her eyes. "'Did you kiss me, Tom?' "'Why, yes, I did.' "'Are you sure you did, Tom?' "'Why, yes, I did, Auntie, certain sure.' "'What did you kiss me for, Tom?' "'Because I loved you so, and you laid there moaning, and I was so sorry.' The words sounded like truth. The old lady could not hide a tremor in her voice when she said, "'Kiss me again, Tom, and be off with you to school now, and don't bother me any more.' The moment he was gone, she ran to a closet and got out the ruin of a jacket which Tom had gone pirating in. Then she stopped with it in her hand, and said to herself, "'No, I don't dare.' 
Poor boy, I reckon he'd lied about it. But it's a blessed, blessed lie. There's such a comfort come from it. I hope the Lord, I know the Lord, will forgive him, because it was such good-heartedness in him to tell it. But I don't want to find out it's a lie. I won't look." She put the jacket away and stood by, musing a minute. Twice she put out her hand to take the garment again, and twice she refrained. Once more she ventured, and this time she fortified herself with the thought, "'It's a good lie. It's a good lie. I won't let it grieve me.' So she sought the jacket pocket. A moment later she was reading Tom's piece of bark through the flowing tears and saying, "'I forgive the boy now if he'd committed a million sins.'" End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 Tom Takes Becky's Punishment There was something about Aunt Polly's manner when she kissed Tom that swept away his low spirits and made him light-hearted and happy again. He started to school, and had the luck of coming upon Becky Thatcher at the head of Meadow Lane. His mood always determined his manner. Without a moment's hesitation he ran to her and said, "'I acted mighty mean to-day, Becky, and I'm so sorry. I won't ever, ever do that way again. As long as I ever live, please make up, won't you?' The girl stopped and looked at him scornfully in the face. "'I'll thank you to keep yourself to yourself, Mr. Thomas Sawyer. I'll never speak to you again.' She tossed her head and passed on. Tom was so stunned that he had not even presence of mind enough to say, "'Who cares, Miss Smarty?' until the right time to say it had gone by. So he said nothing. But he was in a fine rage, nevertheless. He moped into the schoolyard, wishing she were a boy, and imagining how he would trounce her if she were. He presently encountered her, and delivered a stinging remark as he passed. She hurled one in return, and the angry breach was complete. It seemed to Becky, in her hot resentment, that she could hardly wait for school to take in. She was so impatient to see Tom flogged for the injured spelling-book. If she had had any lingering notion of exposing Alfred Temple, Tom's offensive fling had driven it entirely away. Poor girl! She did not know how fast she was nearing trouble herself. The master, Mr. Dobbins, had reached middle age with an unsatisfied ambition. The darling of his desires was to be a doctor, but poverty had decreed that he should be nothing higher than a village schoolmaster. Every day he took a mysterious book out of his desk and absorbed himself in it at times when no classes were reciting. He kept that book under lock and key. There was not an urchin in school, but was perishing to have a glimpse of it, but the chance never came. Every boy and girl had a theory about the nature of that book, but no two theories were alike, and there was no way of getting at the facts in the case. Now, as Becky was passing by the desk, which stood near the door, she noticed that the key was in the lock. It was a precious moment. She glanced around, found herself alone, and the next instant she had the book in her hands. The title page, Professor Somebody's Anatomy, carried no information to her mind, so she began to turn the leaves. She came at once upon a handsomely engraved and colored frontispiece, a human figure, stark naked. At that moment a shadow fell on the page, and Tom Sawyer stepped in at the door and caught the glimpse of the picture. Becky snatched at the book to close it, and had the hard luck to tear the pictured plate half down the middle. She thrust the volumes into the desk, turned the key, and burst out crying with shame and vexation. "'Tom Sawyer, you are just as mean as you can be to sneak up on a person and, and look at what they're looking at. How could I know you was looking at anything? You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Tom Sawyer. You know you're going to tell on me, and I—I—what shall I do? What, what shall I do? I'll be whipped, and I never was whipped in school.' Then she stamped her little foot and said, "'Be so mean if you want to. I know something that's going to happen. You just wait, and you'll see. Hateful, hateful, hateful!' And she flung out of the house with a new explosion of crying. Tom stood still, rather flustered by this onslaught. Presently he said to himself, "'What a curious kind of a fool a girl is! Never been licked in school. Shucks! What's a lickin'? That's just like a girl. They're so thin-skinned and chicken-hearted. Well, of course, I ain't going to tell old Dobbins on this little fool, because there's other ways of getting even on her that ain't so mean. But what of it? Old Dobbins will ask who it was tore his book. Nobody'll answer. Then he'll do just the way he always does, ask first one, then t'other, and when he comes to the right girl he'll know it, without any telling. Girls' faces always tell on them. They ain't got any backbone. She'll get licked. Well, it's a kind of a tight place for Becky Thatcher, because there ain't any way out of it." Tom conned the thing a moment longer, and then added, "'All right, though. She'd like to see me in such a fix. Let her sweat it out.' Tom joined the mob of skylarking scholars outside. In a few moments the master arrived, and school took in. 
Tom did not feel a strong interest in his studies. Every time he stole a glance at the girl's side of the room, Becky's face troubled him. Considering all things, he did not want to pity her, and yet it was all he could do to help it. He could get up no exaltation that was really worthy the name. Presently the spelling-book discovery was made, and Tom's mind was entirely full of his own matters for a while after that. Becky roused up from her lethargy of distress and showed good interest in the proceedings. She did not expect that Tom could get out of his trouble by denying that he spilt the ink on the book himself, and she was right. The denial only seemed to make the thing worse for Tom. Becky supposed she would be glad of that, and she tried to believe she was glad of it, but she found she was not certain. When the worst came to the worst, she had an impulse to get up and tell on Alfred Temple. But she made an effort, and forced herself to keep still. Because, said she to herself, he'll tell about me tearing the book, sure. I wouldn't say a word not to save his life. Tom took his whipping and went back to his seat, not at all broken-hearted, for he thought it was possible that he had unknowingly upset the ink on the spelling-book himself in some skylarking bout. He had denied it for form's sake, and because it was custom, and had stuck to the denial from principle. A whole hour drifted by, the master sat nodding in his throne, the air was drowsy with the hum of study. By and by Mr. Dobbin straightened himself up, yawned, and then unlocked his desk and reached for his book, but seemed undecided whether to take it out or leave it. Most of the pupils glanced up languidly, but there was two among them that watched his movements with intent eyes. Mr. Dobbins fingered his book absently for a while, then took it out and settled himself in his chair to read. Tom shot a glance at Becky. He had seen a hunted and helpless rabbit look as she did, with a gun leveled at its head. Instantly he forgot his quarrel with her. Quick! Something must be done. Done in a flash, too. But the very imminence of the emergency paralyzed his invention. Good! He had an inspiration. He would run and snatch the book, spring through the door, and fly. But his resolution shook for one little instant, and the chance was lost. The master opened the volume. If Tom only had the wasted opportunity back again! Too late! There was no help for Becky now, he said. The next moment the master faced the school. Every eye sank under his gaze. There was that in it which smote even the innocent with fear. There was silence while one might count ten. The master was gathering his wrath. Then he spoke. Who tore this book? There was not a sound. One could have heard a pin drop. The stillness continued. The master searched face after face for signs of guilt. Benjamin Rogers, did you tear this book? A denial. Another pause. Joseph Harper, did you? Another denial. Tom's uneasiness grew more and more intense under the slow torture of these proceedings. The master scanned the ranks of boys, considered a while, then turned to the girls. Amy Lawrence. A shake of the head. Gracie Miller. The same sign. Susan Harper, did you do this? Another negative. The next girl was Becky Thatcher. Tom was trembling from head to foot, with excitement and a sense of hopelessness of the situation. "'Rebecca Thatcher!' Tom glanced at her face. It was white with terror. "'Did you tear—no, look me in the face!' Her hands rose in appeal. "'Did you tear this book?' A thought shot like lightning through Tom's brain. He sprang to his feet and shouted, "'I done it!' The school stared in perplexity at this incredible folly. Tom stood a moment to gather his dismembered faculties, and when he stepped forward to go to his punishment, the surprise, the gratitude, the adoration that shone upon him out of poor Becky's eyes seemed pay enough for a hundred floggings. Inspired by the splendor of his own act, he took without an outcry the most merciless flaying that even Mr. Dobbins had ever administered, and also received with indifference the added cruelty of a command to remain two hours after school should be dismissed for he knew who would wait for him outside till his captivity was done, and not count the tedious time as loss, either. Tom went to bed that night planning vengeance against Alfred Temple, for with shame and repentance Becky had told him all, not forgetting her own treachery. But even the longing for vengeance had to give way soon to pleasanter musings, and he fell asleep at last, with Becky's latest words lingering dreamily in his ear. Tom. How could you be so noble? End of chapter 20 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain Chapter 21 
eloquence and the master's gilded dome. Vacation was approaching. The schoolmaster, always severe, grew severer and more exacting than ever, for he wanted the school to make a good showing on examination day. His rod and his ferrule were seldom idle now, at least among the smaller pupils. Only the biggest boys and young ladies of eighteen and twenty escaped lashing. Mr. Dobbin's lashings were very vigorous ones, too for although he carried under his wig a perfectly bald and shiny head, he had only reached middle age, and there was no sign of feebleness in his muscle. As the great day approached, all the tyranny that was in him came to the surface. He seemed to take a vindictive pleasure in punishing the least shortcomings. The consequence was that the smaller boys spent their days in terror and suffering, and their nights in plotting revenge. They threw away no opportunity to do the master a mischief but he kept ahead all the time. The retribution that followed every vengeful success was so sweeping and majestic that the boys always retired from the field, badly worsted. At last they conspired together and hit upon a plan that promised a dazzling victory. They swore in the sign-painter's boy, told him the scheme, and asked his help. He had his own reason for being delighted, for the master boarded in his father's family, and had given the boy ample cause to hate him. The master's wife would go on a visit to the country in a few days, and there would be nothing to interfere with the plan. The master always prepared himself for great occasions by getting pretty well fuddled, and the sign-painter's boy said that when the dominie had reached the proper condition on examination evening, he would manage the thing while he napped in his chair. Then he would have him awakened at the right time and hurried away to school. In the fullness of time the interesting occasion arrived. At eight in the evening the schoolhouse was brilliantly lighted, and adorned with wreaths and festoons of foliage and flowers. The master sat throned in his great chair upon a raised platform with his blackboard behind him. He was looking tolerably mellow. Three rows of benches on each side and six rows in front of him were occupied by the dignitaries of the town and by the parents of the pupils. To his left, back of the rows of citizens, was a spacious temporary platform upon which were seated the scholars who were to take part in the exercises of the evening. Rows of small boys, washed and dressed to an intolerable state of discomfort, rows of gawky big boys, snowbanks of girls and young ladies clad in lawn and muslin and conspicuously conscious of their bare arms, their grandmother's ancient trinkets, their bits of pink and blue ribbon, and the flowers in their hair. All the rest of the house was filled with non-participating scholars. The exercises began. A very little boy stood up and sheepishly recited, "'You'd scarce expect one of my age to speak in public on the stage,' etc., accompanying himself with the painfully exact and spasmodic gestures which a machine might have used, supposing the machine to be a trifle out of order. But he got through safely, though cruelly scared and got a fine round of applause when he made his manufactured bow and retired. A little shamefaced girl lisped, "'Mary had a little lamb,' etc., performed a compassion-inspired curtsy, got her meed of applause, and sat down flushed and happy. Tom Sawyer stepped forward with conceited confidence, and soared into the unquenchable and indestructible "'Give me liberty or give me death!' speech, with fine fury and frantic gesticulation, and broke down in the middle of it. A ghastly stage-fright seized him. His legs quaked under him, and he was like to choke. True, he had the manifest sympathy of the house, but he had the house's silence, too, which was even worse than its sympathy. The master frowned, and this completed the disaster. Tom struggled a while, and then retired utterly defeated. There was a weak attempt at applause, but it died early. The boy stood on the burning deck, followed. Also, the Assyrian came down, and other declamatory gems. Then there were reading exercises and a spelling fight. The meagre Latin class recited with honor. The prime feature of the evening was in order now, original compositions by the young ladies. Each in her turn stepped forward to the edge of the platform, cleared her throat, held up her manuscript tied with dainty ribbon, and proceeded to read, with labored attention to expression, and punctuation. 
the themes were the same that had been illuminated upon similar occasions by their mothers before them, their grandmothers, and doubtless all their ancestors in the female line clear back to the Crusades. Friendship was one. Memories of other days. Religion in history. Dreamland. The advantages of culture. Forms of political government compared and contrasted. Melancholy. Filial love heart longings, etc., etc. A prevalent feature in these compositions was a nursed and petted melancholy. Another was a wasteful and opulent gush of fine language. Another was a tendency to lug in by the ears particularly prized words and phrases until they were worn entirely out, and a peculiarity that conspicuously marked and marred them was the inveterate and intolerable sermon that wagged its crippled tail at the end of each and every one of them. No matter what the subject might be, a brain-racking effort was made to squirm it into some aspect or other that the moral and religious mind could contemplate with edification. The glaring insincerity of these sermons was not sufficient to compass the banishment of the fashion from the schools, and it is not sufficient today. It never will be sufficient while the world stands, perhaps. There is no school in all our land where the young ladies do not feel obliged to close their compositions with a sermon. And you will find that the sermon of the most frivolous and the least religious girl in the school is always the longest and the most relentlessly pious. But enough of this. Homely truth is unpalatable. Let us return to the examination. The first composition that was read was one entitled, Is This, Then, Life? Perhaps the reader can endure and extract from it. In the common walks of life, with what delightful emotions does the youthful mind look forward to some anticipated scene of festivity? Imagination is busy sketching rose-tinted pictures of joy. In fancy, the voluptuous votary of fashion sees herself amid the festive throng, the observed of all observers. Her graceful form, arrayed in snowy robes, is whirling through the mazes of the joyous dance. Her eye is brightest, her step is lightest in the gay assembly. In such delicious fancies time quickly glides by, and the welcome hour arrives for her entrance into the Elysian world, of which she has had such bright dreams. How fairy-like does everything appear to her enchanted vision! Each new scene is more charming than the last but after a while she finds that beneath this goodly exterior all is vanity. The flattery which once charmed her soul now grates harshly upon her ear. The ballroom has lost its charms, and with wasted health and embittered heart she turns away with a conviction that earthly pleasures cannot satisfy the longings of the soul. And so forth and so on. There was a buzz of gratification from time to time during the reading, accompanied by whispered ejaculations of, "'How sweet! How eloquent! So true!' etc., and after the thing had closed with a peculiarly afflicting sermon, the applause was enthusiastic. Then arose a slight melancholy girl, whose face had the interesting paleness that comes of pills and indigestion, and read a poem. Two stanzas of it will do. A Missouri Maiden's Farewell to Alabama Alabama, good-bye, I love thee well, but yet for a while do I leave thee now. Sad, yes, sad thoughts of thee my heart doth swell, and burning recollections throng my brow, for I have wandered through thy flowery woods, have roamed and read near Tallapoosa's stream, have listened to Tallassee's warring floods, and wooed on Coosa's side Aurora's beam. Yet shame I not to bear an oarful heart, nor blush to turn behind my tearful eyes. Tis from no stranger land I now must part, tis to no stranger's left I yield these sighs. Welcome and home were mine within this state, whose veils I leave, whose spires fade fast from me, and cold must be mine eyes and heart and tete, when, dear Alabama, they turn cold on thee. There were very few there who knew what tet meant, but the poem was very satisfactory, nevertheless. Next appeared a dark-complexioned, black-eyed, black-haired young lady, who paused an impressive moment, assumed a tragic expression, and began to read in a measured, solemn tone. A VISION Dark and tempestuous was night. 
Around the throne on high not a single star quivered, but the deep intonations of the heavy thunder constantly vibrated upon the ear, whilst the terrific lightning revelled in angry mood through the cloudy chambers of heaven, seeming to scorn the power exerted over its terror by the illustrious Franklin. Even the boisterous winds unanimously came forth from their mystic homes, and blustered about as if to enhance by their aid the wildness of the scene. At such a time, so dark, so dreary, for human sympathy my very spirit sighed, but instead thereof, My dearest friend, my counsellor, my comforter and guide, my joy in grief, my second bliss in joy, came to my side. She moved like one of those bright beings pictured in the sunny walks of fancies Eden by the romantic and young, a queen of beauty unadorned save by her own transcendent loveliness. So soft was her step, it failed to make even a sound, and but for the magical thrill imparted by her genial touch, as other unobtrusive beauties, she would have glided away unperceived, unsought. A strange sadness rested upon her features like icy tears upon the robe of December, as she pointed to the contending elements without, and bade me contemplate the two beings presented. This nightmare occupied some ten pages of manuscript, and wound up with a sermon so destructive of all hope to non-Presbyterians, that it took the first prize. This composition was considered to be the very finest effort of the evening. The mayor of the village, in delivering the prize to the author of it, made a warm speech in which he said that it was by far the most eloquent thing he had ever listened to, and that Daniel Webster himself might well be proud of it. It may be remarked in passing that the number of compositions in which the word beauteous was overfondled, and human experience referred to as life's pages, was up to the usual average. Now the master, mellow almost to the verge of geniality, put his chair aside, turned his back to the audience, and began to draw a map of America on the blackboard, to exercise the geography class upon. But he made a sad business of it with his unsteady hand, and a smothered titter rippled over the house. He knew what the matter was, and set himself to write it. He sponged out lines and remade them, but he only distorted them more than ever, and the tittering was more pronounced. He threw his entire attention upon his work now, as if determined not to be put down by the mirth. He felt that all eyes were fastened upon him. He imagined he was succeeding, and yet the tittering continued. It even manifestly increased, and well it might. There was a garret above, pierced with a scuttle over his head, and down through this scuttle came a cat, suspended around the haunches by a string. She had a rag tied about her head and jaws to keep her from mewing. As she slowly descended, she curved upward and clawed at the string. She swung downward and clawed at the intangible air. The tittering rose higher and higher. The cat was within six inches of the absorbed teacher's head. Down, down, a little lower, and she grabbed his wig with her desperate claws, clung to it, and was snatched up into the garret in an instant with her trophy still in her possession and how the light did blaze abroad from the master's bald pate, for the sign-painter's boy had gilded it. That broke up the meeting. The boys were avenged. Vacation had come. Note. The pretended compositions quoted in this chapter are taken without alteration from a volume entitled Prose and Poetry by a Western Lady, but they are exactly and precisely after the schoolgirl pattern and hence are much happier than any mere imitations could be. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 Huck Finn Quotes Scriptures Tom joined the new order of cadets of temperance, being attracted by the showy character of their regalia. He promised to abstain from smoking, chewing, and profanity as long as he remained a member. Now he found out a new thing, namely, that to promise not to do a thing is the surest way in the world to make a body want to go and do that very thing. Tom soon found himself tormented with a desire to drink and swear. The desire grew to be so intense that nothing but the hope of a chance to display himself in his red sash kept him from withdrawing from the order. Fourth of July was coming, but he soon gave that up, 
gave it up before he had worn his shackles over forty-eight hours, and fixed his hopes upon old Judge Fraser, Justice of the Peace, who was apparently on his deathbed and would have a big public funeral, since he was so high an official. During three days Tom was deeply concerned about the judge's condition and hungry for news of it. Sometimes his hopes ran high, so high that he would venture to get out his regalia and practice before the looking-glass. But the judge had a most discouraging way of fluctuating. At last he was pronounced upon the mend, and then convalescent. Tom was disgusted, and felt a sense of injury, too. He handed in his resignation at once, and that night the judge suffered a relapse and died. Tom resolved that he would never trust a man like that again. The funeral was a fine thing. The cadets paraded in a style calculated to kill the late member with envy. Tom was a free boy again, however. There was something in that. He could drink and swear now, but found to his surprise that he did not want to. The simple fact that he could took the desire away and the charm of it. Tom presently wondered to find that his coveted vacation was beginning to hang a little heavily on his hands. He attempted a diary, but nothing happened during three days, and so he abandoned it. The first of all the negro minstrel shows came to town, and made a sensation. Tom and Joe Harper got up a band of performers and were happy for two days. Even the glorious fourth was in some sense a failure, for it rained hard, there was no procession in consequence, and the greatest man in the world, as Tom supposed, Mr. Benton, an actual United States Senator, proved an overwhelming disappointment, for he was not twenty-five feet high, nor even anywhere in the neighborhood of it. A circus came. The boys played circus for three days afterward in tents made of rag-carpeting. Admission, three pins for boys, two for girls, and then circusing was abandoned. A phrenologist and a mesmerizer came, and went again and left the village duller and drearier than ever. There were some boys' and girls' parties, but they were so few and so delightful that they only made the aching voids between ache the harder. Becky Thatcher was gone to her Constantinople home to stay with her parents during vacation, so there was no bright side to life anywhere. The dreadful secret of the murder was a chronic misery. It was a very cancer for permanency and pain. Then came the measles. During two long weeks Tom lay a prisoner, dead to the world and its happenings. He was very ill. He was interested in nothing. When he got upon his feet at last and moved feebly downtown, a melancholy change had come over everything and every creature. There had been a revival, and everybody had got religion, not only the adults, but even the boys and girls. Tom went about, hoping against hope for the sight of one blessed sinful face, but disappointment crossed him everywhere. He found Joe Harper studying a testament, and turned sadly away from the depressing spectacle. He sought Ben Rogers, and found him visiting the poor with a basket of tracts. He hunted up Jim Hollis, who called his attention to the precious blessing of his late measles as a warning. Every boy he encountered added another ton to his depression, and when, in desperation, he flew for refuge at last to the bosom of Huckleberry Finn, and was received with a scriptural quotation, his heart broke and he crept home and to bed, realizing that he alone of all the town was lost forever and forever. And that night there came on a terrific storm, with driving rain, awful claps of thunder, and blinding sheets of lightning. He covered his head with his bedclothes, and waited in a horror of suspense for his doom, for he had not the shadow of a doubt that all this hubbub was about him. He believed he had taxed the forbearance of the powers above to the extremity of endurance, and that this was the result. It might have seemed to him a waste of pomp and ammunition to kill a bug with a battery of artillery, but there seemed nothing incongruous about the getting up such an expensive thunderstorm as this to knock the turf from under an insect like himself. By and by the tempest spent itself and died without accomplishing its object. The boy's first impulse was to be grateful and reform. His second was to wait, for there might not be any more storms. The next day the doctors were back. Tom had relapsed. The three weeks he spent on his back this time seemed an entire age. When he got abroad at last he was hardly grateful that he had been spared, remembering how lonely was his estate, how companionless and forlorn he was. He drifted listlessly down the street and found Jim Hollis acting as judge in a juvenile court that was trying a cat for murder, 
in the presence of her victim, a bird. He found Joe Harper and Huck Finn up an alley eating a stolen melon. Poor lads! They, like Tom, had suffered a relapse. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 The Salvation of Muff Potter At last the sleepy atmosphere was stirred, and vigorously. The murder trial came on in the court. It became the absorbing topic of village talk immediately. Tom could not get away from it. Every reference to the murder sent a shudder to his heart, for his troubled conscience and fears almost persuaded him that these remarks were put forth in his hearing as feelers. He did not see how he could be suspected of knowing anything about the murder, but still he could not be comfortable in the midst of this gossip. It kept him in a cold shiver all the time. He took Huck to a lonely place to have a talk with him. It would be some relief to unseal his tongue for a little while, to divide his burden of distress with another sufferer. Moreover, he wanted to assure himself that Huck had remained discreet. "'Huck, have you ever told anybody about—that? About what? You know what? Oh, co course I haven't. Never a word? Never a solitary word, so help me. What makes you ask? Well, I was afeard. Why, Tom Sawyer, we wouldn't be alive two days if that got found out. You know that." Tom felt more comfortable. After a pause, "'Huck, they couldn't anybody get you to tell, could they?' "'Get me to tell? Why, if I wanted that half-breed devil to drown me, they could get me to tell. They ain't no different way.' "'Well, that's all right, then. I reckon we're safe as long as we keep mum. But let's swear again, anyway. It's more sure.' "'I'm agreed.' So they swore again with dread solemnities. What is the talk around, Huck? I've heard a power of it. Talk? Well, it's just Muff Potter, Muff Potter, Muff Potter all the time. It keeps me in a sweat, constant, so as I want to hide somewheres. That's just the same way they go on round me. I reckon he's a goner. Don't you feel sorry for him sometimes? Most always, most always. He ain't no account, but then he ain't ever done anything to hurt anybody. Just fishes a little, to get money to get drunk on, and loafs around considerable. But, Lord, we all do that, leastways most of us, preachers and such like. But he's kind of good. He give me half a fish once, when there weren't enough for two. And lots of times he's kind of stood by me when I was out of luck. Well, he's mended kites for me, Huck, and knitted hooks onto my line. I, I wish we could get him out of there. My, we couldn't get him out, Tom. And besides, twouldn't do any good. They'd catch him again. Yes, so they would. But I hate to hear him abuse him so like the dickens when he never done that. I do too, Tom. Lord, I hear him say he's the bloodiest looking villain in this country, and they wonder he wasn't ever hung before. Yes, they talk like that all the time. I've heard him say that if he was to get free, they'd lynch him. And they'd do it, too. The boys had a long talk, but it brought them little comfort. As the twilight drew on, they found themselves hanging about the neighborhood of the little isolated jail, perhaps with an undefined hope that something would happen that might clear away their difficulties. But nothing happened. There seemed to be no angels or fairies interested in this luckless captive. The boys did as they had often done before, went to the cell grating, and gave Potter some tobacco and matches. He was on the ground floor, and there were no guards. His gratitude for their gifts had always smote their conscience before. It cut deeper than ever this time. They felt cowardly and treacherous to the last degree when Potter said, "'You've been mighty good to me, boys, better than anybody else in this town. And I don't forget it, I don't. Often I says to myself, says I, I used to mend all the boys' kites and things, and show em where the good fishing places was, and befriend em what I could. And now they've all forgot old Muff, when he's in trouble. But Tom don't, and Huck don't. They don't forget him, says I, and I don't forget them. Well, boys, I had done an awful thing. Drunk and crazy at the time. That's the only way I count for it. And now I got to swing for it. And it's right. Right. And best, too, I reckon. I hope so, anyway. Well, we won't talk about that. I don't want to make you feel bad. You've befriended me. But what I want to say is, don't you ever get drunk. Then you won't ever get here. Stand a little further west, so that's it. It's a prime comfort to see faces that's friendly when a body's in such a muck of trouble, and there don't none come here but yourn. Good friendly faces. Good friendly faces. 
Get up on one other's backs and and let me touch em. That's it. Shake hands. Yearn'll come through the bars, but mine's too big. Little hands and weak, and they've helped Muff Potter a power, and they'd help him more if they could. Tom went home miserable, and his dreams that night were full of horrors. The next day and the day after he hung about the courtroom, drawn by an impossible irresistible impulse to go in, but forcing himself to stay out. Huck was having the same experience. They studiously avoided each other. Each wandered away from time to time, but the same dismal fascination always brought them back presently. Tom kept his ears open when idlers sauntered out of the courtroom, but invariably heard distressing news. The toils were closing more and more relentlessly around poor Potter. At the end of the second day the village talk was to the effect that Injun Joe's evidence stood firm and unshaken, and that there was not the slightest question as to what the jury's verdict would be. Tom was out late that night, and came to bed through the window. He was in a tremendous state of excitement. It was hours before he got to sleep. All the village flocked to the courthouse the next morning, for this was to be the great day. Both sexes were about equally represented in the packed audience. After a long wait the jury filed in and took their places. Shortly afterward Potter, pale and haggard, timid and hopeless, was brought in, with chains upon him, and seated where all the curious eyes could stare at him. No less conspicuous was Injun Joe, stolid as ever. There was another pause, and then the judge arrived and the sheriff proclaimed the opening of the court. The usual whisperings among the lawyers and gathering together of papers followed. These details and accompanying delays worked up an atmosphere of preparation that was as impressive as it was fascinating. Now a witness was called who testified that he found Muff Potter washing in the brook at an early hour of the morning that the murder was discovered, and that he immediately sneaked away. After some further questioning, counsel for the prosecution said, "'Take the witness.' The prisoner raised his eyes for a moment, but dropped them again, when his own counsel said, "'I have no questions to ask him.' The next witness proved the finding of the knife near the corpse. Counsel for the prosecution said, "'Take the witness.' "'I have no questions to ask him,' Potter's lawyer replied. A third witness swore he had often seen the knife in Potter's possession. "'Take the witness.' counsel for Potter declined to question him. The faces of the audience began to betray annoyance. Did this attorney mean to throw away his client's life without an effort? Several witnesses deposed concerning Potter's guilty behavior when brought to the scene of the murder. They were allowed to leave the stand without being cross-questioned. Every detail of the damaging circumstances that occurred in the graveyard upon that morning which all present remembered so well was brought out by credible witnesses, but none of them were cross-examined by Potter's lawyer. The perplexity and dissatisfaction of the house expressed itself in murmurs and provoked a reproof from the bench. Counsel for the prosecution now said, "'By the oaths of citizens whose simple word is above suspicion, we have fastened this awful crime, beyond all possibility of question, upon the unhappy prisoner at the bar. We rest our case here." A groan escaped from poor Potter, and he put his face in his hands and rocked his body softly to and fro, while a painful silence reigned in the courtroom. Many men were moved, and many women's compassion testified itself in tears. Counsel for the defense rose and said, your Honor, in our remarks at the opening of this trial, we foreshadowed our purpose to prove that our client did this fearful deed while under the influence of a blind and irresponsible delirium produced by drink. We have changed our mind. We shall not offer that plea. Then to the clerk, Call Thomas Sawyer. A puzzled amazement awoke in every face in the house, not even excepting Potter's. Every eye fastened itself with wondering interest upon Tom as he rose and took his place upon the stand. The boy looked wild enough, for he was badly scared. The oath was administered. "'Thomas Sawyer, where were you on the 17th of June, about the hour of midnight?' Tom glanced at Injun Joe's iron face, and his tongue failed him. The audience listened breathless, but the words refused to come. After a few moments, however, the boy got a little of his strength back, and managed to put enough of it into his voice to make part of the house here. "'In the graveyard?' "'A little bit louder, please. Don't be afraid. You were in the graveyard.' A contemptuous smile flitted across Injun Joe's face. 
Were you anywhere near Horse William's grave? Yes, sir. Speak up, just a trifle louder. How near were you? Near as I am to you. Were you hidden or not? I was hid. Where? Behind the elms that's on the edge of the grave. Injun Joe gave a barely perceptible start. Anyone with you? Yes, sir. I went there with— Wait, wait a moment. Never mind mentioning your companion's name. We will produce him at the proper time. Did you carry anything there with you? Tom hesitated and looked confused. Speak out, my boy. Don't be diffident. The truth is always respectable. What did you take there? Only, uh, uh, dead cat. There was a ripple of mirth which the court checked. We will produce the skeleton of that cat. Now, my boy, tell us everything that occurred. Tell it in your own way. Don't skip anything, and don't be afraid. Tom began hesitatingly at first, but as he warmed to his subject his words flowed more and more easily. In a little while every sound ceased but his own voice. Every eye fixed itself upon him. With parted lips and bated breath the audience hung upon his words, taking no note of time, wrapped in the ghastly fascination of the tale. The strain upon pent emotion reached its climax when the boy said, "'And as the doctor fetched the board around and Muff Potter fell, Injun Joe jumped with a knife and—' Crash! Quick as lightning the half-breed sprang for a window, tore his way through all opposers, and was gone. End of chapter 23 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain Chapter 24 Splendid Days and Fearsome Nights Tom was a glittering hero once more, the pet of the old, the envy of the young. His name even went into immortal print, for the village paper magnified him. There were some that believed he would be president yet if he escaped hanging. As usual, the fickle, unreasoning world took Muff Potter to its bosom, and fondled him as lavishly as it had abused him before. But that sort of conduct is to the world's credit, therefore it is not well to find fault with it. Tom's days were days of splendor and exaltation to him, but his nights were seasons of horror. Injun Joe infested all his dreams, and all was with doom in his eye. Hardly any temptation could persuade the boy to stir abroad after nightfall. Poor Huck was in the same state of wretchedness and terror, for Tom had told the whole story to the lawyer the night before the great day of the trial, and Huck was sore afraid that his share in the business might leak out yet, notwithstanding Injun Joe's flight had saved him the suffering of testifying in court. The poor fellow had got the attorney to promise secrecy, but what of that, since Tom's harassed conscience had managed to drive him to the lawyer's house by night, and wring a dread tale from lips that had been sealed with the dismalest and most formidable of oaths, Huck's confidence in the human race was well-nigh obliterated. Daily Muff Potter's gratitude made Tom glad he had spoken, but nightly he wished he had sealed up his tongue. Half the time Tom was afraid Injun Joe would never be captured, the other half he was afraid he would be. He felt sure he never could draw a safe breath again until that man was dead and he had seen the corpse. Rewards had been offered, the country had been scoured, but no Injun Joe was found. One of those omniscient and awe-inspiring marvels, a detective, came up from St. Louis, moused around, shook his head, looked wise, and made that sort of astounding success which members of the craft usually achieve. That is to say, he found a clue. But you can't hang a clue for murder, and so after that detective had got through and gone home, Tom felt just as insecure as he was before. The slow days drifted on, and each left behind it a slightly lightened weight of apprehension. End of chapter 24